What is up, YouTube? This is Red Leprechaun Gaming, and welcome back to He Who Fights with Monsters, Book 5 by Shirtaloon. Chapter 19, Media Landscape. Smoke rose from the smoldering buildings into an orange sunset over Broken Hill. Shade, Jason said quietly as he looked over at the EOA media team filming further down the ruined street. Please find an ordinary handgun and discreetly leave it nearby. Jason had spotted enough armed dead that it wouldn't be a difficult task. He had seen the military personnel, mostly clustered around their post near the tent city. Many of them had been killed by firearms rather than monsters. Only a handful of the military had survived, isolated and armed with weapons that couldn't harm the monsters. He got them out with the other survivors, although a few had insisted on trying to fight. Rather than let them learn the hard way, he and Shade knocked them out and then shoved them into the bus with the others. He had also seen some black-clad corpses rather than the network's tactical section, which were likely part of the group responsible for the Broken Hill tragedy. Not all of them had managed to safely extract, whether due to monster attacks or the military and network personnel not going down as easily as anticipated. One of the Shade bodies slipped away unseen in the growing shadows of the evening. Penelope was the leader of the EOA's media team. I don't know that talking to him is a good idea, she said. It's all upsides, said Garrett, the leader of the superhero team. You said to yourself that we were having trouble finding standout personalities in our hero ranks. If we can associate ourselves with Asano, that might change. He's the face of magic right now. I don't think he's going to be very accommodating, Penelope said. That's fine, too. If he accuses us of setting all of this in motion, we use it to tar the network. One way or the other, it's a win for us. We could make it a point that he's a better fit for the League of Heroes than the network, Pe Penelope mused. There's no way he'd jump ship, but we've been working to paint him as one of us who only works for them. An actual interview might help push that along. See, Garrett said, we win every way. They were speaking quietly as the face of the media team, Davina, was giving a voiceover of for the live feed as the camera recorded Jason. As the sun truly sets on Broken Hill, we can only wonder if the historic town will ever see a new dawn after the catastrophe it has suffered. For all of his valiant efforts, Jason Asano, the Starlight Rider, stands in the ruins of the Global Defense Network's failure. Again, we apologize to viewers for the graphic images on display... As Davina continued to narrate, Penelope silently grabbed her attention, communicating her intentions with hand signals. Davina nodded. We're going to approach Mr. Asano with the head of the League of the Heroes team, Garrett Dunhurst, a.k.a. Skybolt. Skybolt, this will be your first time meeting your fellow hero, is this correct? It is, Davina, and I only wish it could be under better circumstances. Unfortunately, the crisis we all face means that every hero is facing terrible circumstances, and the Starlight Rider is no exception. Davina, Garrett, and the camera operator approached Jason. They could only see the silver eyes under his hood, the light of the camera failing to penetrate the shadows. Mr. Asano, despite working side by side with your fellow heroes, the death toll is nearly in the thousands. Do you think that closer collaboration with our fellow heroes might reduce the impact should further GDN safe zones be compromised? Seconds ticked over in the dead air as they waited for Jason's response. Mr. Asano, you think we're heroes, Jason asked in a voice of weariness-infused gravel. Stepping forward is the absolute minimum to expect of people with our abilities. To do any less would make us nothing but worthless cowards. If you want to see heroes, look to the people who have no powers, yet they stepped into the same field as us. And why did they do that? For no more reason that there were people in need of help. They don't have the strength to face what we can face, but here they are, making the ultimate sacrifice. He gestured at the ruined town around them. If you want to find heroes, go digging through the rubble. They're piled high. You think we compare to them because we run around in costumes fighting monsters. We protect people, Garrett said. We aren't the ones that will get the world through this calamity, Jason said. We can help some people, yes, but we're just a symbol. The people of the world will get through this disaster not by waiting for some fool in a costume like me to save them. They'll get through this by coming together, the human race united. 
a network of people who are heroes not for the powers they possess, but their willingness to raise one another out of the darkness. Garrett could feel himself losing control of the narrative, and tried to guide Jason towards making an accusation. Those people will need help and leadership, guidance, heroes to show them the way. Surely you recognize that without us, the body count today would have been much greater, perhaps even total. Leadership and guidance, Jason repeated. That's the kind of language you hear from dictators. In the free world, we choose our leaders. They don't choose us. But I could see why you would think of it that way, given where your powers come from. We may accept that your League of Heroes are here because of the monsters, and we need everyone we can get. But I don't forget who unleashed those monsters in the first place, so that you could run around playing super friends. There will come a day when the monsters aren't looming over us, and the people hiding behind you will face a reckoning. Just to be clear, Davina said, Mr. Asano, are you claiming that there are some kind of secret cabal behind the League of Heroes who brought the monsters down on us? That is quite the accusation, for which I assume you have some amount of proof. The chuckle that came from inside Jason's dark hood could have frozen water. I don't need to prove anything or convince anyone. The day will come when the people hidden in the dark will die, alone and unknown, and no one will ever hear about it. You were just talking about dictatorship, Davina said. Now you're talking about extrajudicial murder. Someone needs to hold the men behind the curtain to account. But if you don't like it, who's going to stop me, Jason asked. Your heroes here? A pair of silver eyes fixed on Garrett. Are you going to stand in my way, Spybolt? It's Skybolt. I don't care. I'll be the villain to your hero, but you'd best stop me now. You're as strong as you're ever going to get. Well, my power grows with every passing day. He turned back to the reporter. What about you, Davina? You're one of the League's secret heroes. Are you going to stop me? I don't know where you got this idea about me having powers from, but you're completely wrong. Is that so? Shade, if you would. A shadowy figure emerged from the camera operator's shadow, taking the camera off his shoulder and focusing it on Davina. A shadow arm shot out, from Jason and picked up a nearby pistol, which Jason then pointed at the reporter as Shades rose up behind her and Jason both. With silver rank reflexes, Garrett interposed himself between Jason and the reporter, but Jason was already disappearing into his own shade. He emerged behind the reporter, shooting her in the back of the head without hesitation. Davina staggered a few steps, groaning loudly as she held a hand over her head where she was shot. You're a maniac, she spat at Jason, turning around to face him. He pulled his hood back to reveal his face. His eyes were bloodshot, red and puffy from tears. In an instant, he went from faceless menace to a man shattered in grief at the tragedy around him. I'm sorry, he said bitterly, but if that bullet in your head left you with a headache, maybe you don't have powers. That's why you hid instead of stepping out to help these people, right? You can stop your play, Asano, Penelope said. The studio cut the broadcast. Jason didn't bother to say anything more, opening a portal and stepping through. He arrived a short distance from the camp containing the Broken Hill survivors. Jason started walking in that direction over the yellow high grass. You did grab the memory drive from the camera, right? Jason asked. Of course I did, Jade said. I am uncertain how it will help, though, given that the footage went out live. Never underestimate the value of the unedited original, Jason said. There was probably a broadcast delay on the live feed, so there's no telling how much they managed to edit out of our little play. I cannot help but notice that with your ability to control your physiology, as grief-inducing as the day's events were, you should neither get bloodshot eyes nor produce tears. The dead deserve tears, Jason said. Your father best take care of them, or he and I are going to have words. I don't think you are yet ready to threaten the Reaper, Mr. Asano. Not yet. He tucked his hood back up over his head as they drew closer to the camp. This is a wagon load of horse manure, Terence said. I have work to do. Not if you get removed from your position, you don't, Anna told him, as they walked the halls of the network office in Sydney. Make no mistake, if this workplace medi mediation doesn't go well, you will be replaced. As a as a Publicity man, Terence was forced to admire Anna's choice of tearing him down in the, hall, in the halls where anyone could hear. What? 
As a publicity man, Terence was forced to admire Anna's choice of carrying him down in the halls where anyone could and would overhear. It sent a message that upper management was accountable. The general staff were respected, and that family was not a shield against bad behavior. That th did not mean he wouldn't argue back. We have more important things to deal with than someone's feelings getting hurt. Terry, you threatened to have sex with the man's dead father. I've worked with Michael Aram for a long time, and he's a good man whose father was incredibly important to him. You're going to apologize, and you're going to do a good goddamn job, or I will throw you out of the building myself. You can't force me to be sincere. Terry, we all need to be at our very best. If people refuse to deal with you, people that you rely on, then things are going to get missed. If they have someone who has authority over them and is free to abuse them, that is going to distract them from their performance. This isn't you and me in the backyard. These are people that work hard, work well, and are deserving of your respect. The problem here, Terry, is you, and I will exercise that problem one way or another. If you can't get your head around that and realize what you need to do here, then I don't want you here. Which, in case you're not paying attention, means that you won't be. You're not the only member of the steering committee, Anna. Some of the others like the way I do things. And they'll interfere when I try to fire you, Anna acknowledged. But do they have the stones to interfere when I throw you off the roof? Oh, come on, Anna. You'll survive, she said. You can go liquid form. It'll take hours for me to pull myself back together after a fall like that. That's assuming I don't lose any of myself down a storm drain again. Don't worry, Anna said. I'll have the stuff from your office boxed up and waiting in reception when you get back. Jason quietly arrived at Asano, a villi Asano Village in the washed-out light of the pre-dawn. He had spent the night in the survivor's camp, but not to sleep. He hadn't been sure what solace he could offer the survivors, but all he had left to give was time. He would spent additional hours in debrief, and even more talking to the press. Erica and Emmy and Ken gathered around him, catching him in a supportive embrace. They moved to the lounge of the village's main residence, Emmy sitting on a couch between Jason and her mother, each of them holding one of her hands. For all that Emmy's intelligence and maturity was beyond her age, the things she had seen that day had been a lot for a 13-year-old. Erica had told Emmy she shouldn't watch the news, but that hadn't stopped her. They had all been glued to the television, catching every glimpse of Jason amongst the violence and the ruins and the death. Jason and his family sat in awkward silence. Like much of the country, and even the world, they had been watching him on the news all day. It began with the early scraps of action captured by the hiding EOA team, then the interviews with survivors. Footage from Kaito's drones had been fed live to the press, showing Jason moving like a dark, flittering bug in his desperate attempts to extricate survivors. Many countries around the world had fought back against the EOA's media control, including Australia. The Emergency Communications Act passed with overwhelming support in Parliament, despite unprecedented pushback from media on all platforms. Not only did the law enact massive emergency funds for public broadcast networks, but required government information updates to air daily on all free-to-air networks and insisted on an Office of, media distribution, Office of Media Disinformation with fierce enforcement powers. Privacy advocates pushed back against what they what they termed draconian measures against press freedom, which the media companies got entirely behind with complaints about editorial independence. In the wake of tragedy, however, was always the easiest time to curtail civil, civil liberties. Broken Hill was the largest of Australia's disasters, but not the first. I'm not going to keep Shade's bodies with you anymore, Jason said finally. I like being able to communicate and know that he's there if something happens. It's become clear to me, though, that I need to stop splitting my power. Shade had called his bodies back to Jason, but it had taken time for them to get into range. They could only merge from 40 kilometers away, and had emerged into an unmanned surveillance plane, moving at speed before traveling the last leg through the portal. In the time that took, there was one fewer bus picking up survivors than there could have been. Jason couldn't help but think of the lives that he failed to save in that time. 
We understand, Erica said. His mind kept going back to the Waterfall Village where he had fought the Elemental Tyrant as the villagers evacuated. He had saved everyone that day. Everyone. All it had cost him was a scar. He was so much more powerful now, yet he had done so much worse. He was unmarked, but thousands of people were dead. He knew that one monster was different from an entire protospace worth, but that didn't offer him any solace. I need to get stronger, he murmured, head bowed. You're already strong, son, Ken said. No, Jason said. I've seen power so vast that my mind is too limited to comprehend the scope of it. I'm a grain of sand before that, a bug on a windshield. What will you be if you get that kind of power? Erica asked. You're talking about godlike power, right? Is that what you want for yourself? If you become that powerful, will we be the grains of sand to you? Jason looked up at her with tremulous eyes. I don't know. Power isn't everything, Jason, Erica told him, nodding at Emmy's small hand in his. Power can't offer you that. He tilted his head as he sensed a familiar aura approaching. What is it? Ken asked. Someone I know just arrived at the village gate. As in the gate three kilometers away, Erica asked. She and Ken both had aura senses, but theirs barely covered the room. Jace's senses had grown to incredible proportions. They were based on his aura strength, although they reached farther than his aura, like a radar sending out signals. He was still getting a handle on them, though. In the familiar calm of Asano Village, there weren't enough auras to be onerous on his senses. In Broken Hill, the monsters and the chaos had been overwhelming, but he pushed himself to endure, extending his senses to the limit. He had needed to know where their survivors were that needed him most. Jason stood and opened a portal. I'll be back in a moment, he said. Jason emerged from the portal arch outside the village gate. Most of the people camping there had long gone, as food shortages became worse. They had been forced to cities where the government was rationing out food after seizing control of the supply chains. Only the most committed and unhinged people remained outside Asano Village. A car stopped at the front gate, and the security guard on duty had emerged from the booth. It was some distant cousin Jason didn't really know, looking at him nervously. It's fine, Jason said. I'll handle this. Dawn stepped out of the car, an expensive but ordinary European sedan. I'm sorry about what you went through today. Save your sympathy for the families of the dead. Very well. I was hoping you might put me up for a little while. A normal rank avatar isn't up to the rigors of an increasingly dangerous world, as you well know. And that is the end of chapter 19. I'll see you guys in the next one. Until then, have fun, guys.